We are on the topic of of the Obama Presidential Center and its neighborhood because more than a year ago, in spiritual enrichment, we watched a film called On the Brink by Jeff Shulman, uh, the Cousel's Kuz nephew. And it was about a historic African-American community in Seattle called the Central District uh, that became uh, undone really by uh, some, some development that it, it, they didn't act fast enough to work with this development and ended up losing a lot of their historical heritage and the unique cultural aspects of their neighborhood. However, they did manage toward the end of this development process to, um, to work with the economic forces, the gentrification that was happening in their neighborhood, so as to preserve what they could of their historic neighborhood. That's what the movie was about. And then someone said, we should find something locally here in the Chicago area that would help us understand um, how neighborhoods res respond to development in a way that's really something that we understand because it's local to us. So the idea of the Obama Presidential Center as a development coming into the mid South Side area uh, in Chicago was suggested and we got these two great speakers. Last week, we had Alex Goldenberg from STOP, that's Southside Together Organizing for Power. And today we have Guillaume Foreman. Welcome again, Guillaume, so glad you're here. I'm going to uh, read a little bit of Guillaume's bio and then turn it over to him. Uh, Guillaume Foreman is president and CEO of Emerald South Economic Development Collaborative, which generates community wealth and amplifies local culture through shared pride, power, and investment for Chicago's Mid-South Side. Emerald South attracts and coordinates investment through community convening and collaborative partnerships that increase local ownership and prosperity. I'm still admitting some people here. Um, prior to joining Emerald South, Foreman was executive director of the Greater Southwest Development Corporation, a community development corporation on the southwest, southwest side of Chicago. He also previously served as vice president of strategic acquisitions at HSBC. That's a bank, right, Gion? HSBC, big. Yep, one of the largest banks in the world. Yes, it's, it's overseas too, right. Uh, Foreman is also the managing partner of the Washington Park Development Group, a real estate development firm focused on traditionally underserved urban markets. Foreman sits on several boards, including the Chicago Rehab Network, Chicago Land Owners Land Trust, Chicago Housing Authority Support Corporation, and Illinois Attorney Registration Disciplinary Commission. He is currently the president of the Chicago Police Board. He earned a BS from Florida A&M University and an MBA from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. A native Chicagoan, Guion lives with, in Kenwood with his wife, Tracy, and daughter, Jade. Happy Valentine's Day, Guion. Welcome that you're here. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, before, so, so a lot of times when my bio is read, you know, I kind of get into it, but with the topic that we're talking about, I, I just want to kind of add a little bit more. My family actually came to Chicago from the Great Migration as well, not from the South. My grandmother and her siblings came from Denver. My great grandfather was a pastor and he was, he had uh, one of his parishioners was uh, uh, being chased by the KKK. And so that's how we ended up leaving Denver coming to Chicago. So these communities that we were talking about now are the same communities that my family moved to from there. So maybe about two years ago, I went out to Denver to visit the, uh, the church and uh, it's in the historic black neighborhood uh, called Little Five Points. So I'm like, man, I'm gonna go see the church. I'm gonna go to the historic black neighborhood and I'm walking through the neighborhood and I see posters Oh, historic black neighborhood. This happened here. This happened here. But I saw all white people. And so I asked the people in the church, I said, hey, I thought this was the historic black neighborhood. I haven't seen any black people. They said, yeah, it's the historic black neighborhood. It used to be the black neighborhood, right? And so 
I want to speak today, not only giving you some facts and statistics, but to say that we're thinking about this proactively to make sure that how do we preserve history? And it's not just for preserving history for history's sakes, but for the, the, the family to preserve those stories over time and to create new stories. So you heard a little bit about me and uh, my name is Gion Foreman. I am going to share screen right now. I'm gonna start us off with obviously the opportunity why we're having this discussion because the Presidential Center is coming to the Woodlawn community, right? So I'm just gonna start us off with some words from the president. We have been told we cannot do this by a chorus of cynics. They will only grow louder and more dissonant. We have been asked to pause for a reality check. We've been warned against offering the people of this nation false hope. But in the unlikely story that is America, there has never been anything false about hope. So Emerald South, we were created to take advantage of the opportunity of the Presidential Center coming to the community, right? And so thinking of the three neighborhoods that really surround the Presidential Center, those are the communities of Washington Park, Woodlawn, and South Shore. Rich in history, about 90,000 residents and about 700 businesses. We took it a step further and looked at the larger region. So about 220,000 people in this region um, and about you know, 97,000 households. We're, we're, we're fortunate in that within this region, we have the University of Chicago as an a, a anchor institution, as well as IIT, many other cultural uh, institutions. So, but a part of what we have to do is we have to think about how, how, we, how people see the South Side when they hear the South Side. We know all the problems that we have. That's documented every day in the Tribune and the Sun-Times and on the news. And so because that's always focused in a negative lens, we're always on defense. So we said, how do we take a look at what we have uh, uh, in the community and look at those assets that we have? So basically, we want to shift the way that people are looking at our community and, in fact, shift the way that we look at our community. So the first thing we did was we said, well, let's look at this 220,000 people in this region. What could we compare that to? So just looking at populations themselves that have an anchor institution, a university anchor institution, now it's comparable to a Durham, North Carolina, where they have this incredible research triangle, Madison, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin in Richmond, Virginia, right? If we look at the black population that exists within this population, now it gives you Cleveland, Ohio, Atlanta, Georgia, or New Orleans, right? So now, in looking at this, we said, wow, kind of, this is an incredible opportunity. So we said, well, so given the assets that we have, part of what we need to think about is, is how do we create a different economic model? So thinking about how we're directing spending power, how we're activating capital, and how we monetize the creative production that exists. We decided to focus in nine primary areas. These just principles, these nine principles of just development. So one, focusing on local ownership. Two, community density. Obviously, Chicago has a problem with losing population, significant Black population. And so we set a bold goal that we want to attract 10,000 new families, 10,000 new people to come and live in this community. Business raised, which stands for retention, attraction, succession, and expansion. Capital attraction, collaboration, anchor partnerships, cultural production, youth empowerment and placekeeping. We've kind of looked and said, what do we have in this area? So here's IIT up to the north, the University of Chicago and the hospitals. The Obama Center will be featured here in Jackson Park. And you have the Museum of Science and Industry, the DuSable Museum as well. So as we start to think about all that we have here, this is a huge anchor that we have, the eighth largest employment center in the city when it comes to healthcare, as we all know, that this is kind of a leading forefront. We have historic parks and some great uh, uh, um, institutions, cultural institutions in the area. We looked at the investment that's kind of taking place. And this is just back of the envelope. One of the things that we really are doing right now is trying to really calculate where investment is going in, right? Because as we start to think about free markets, you, once something is rolling, it's kind of hard, it's, it's physics. I, I actually keep a physics book here at my desk and it's very applicable to a lot of things. 
And so when an object is in motion, it's kind of hard to stop that, that object. It, it, something has to slow it down. And so we're starting to identify where these investments are in fact taking place. Um, the Obama Center itself will be responsible for almost 1,400 jobs during construction and almost 2,200 jobs post-construction, over uh, $2 billion in economic activity uh, in 10 years. And so we are looking at this and saying, our community has a really unique opportunity, right? With the visitors that are coming, with the dollars that are coming in, how can we strengthen this community? But not just looking to the outside to see where there's opportunity, but also looking internally, right? So what you see here, retail surplus, these are the dollars that are spent within the community, right? There are only several categories, gas stations, uh, 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 liquor stores, hair care. Those are dollars that are spent in the community. Everything else, the dollars are spent outside of the community. So while we are trying to figure out how to attract and improve the community, we also see a real opportunity for to make sure that we can keep some of the dollars within the community and create additional opportunities for the community. Historic. These are some of the historic assets that exist within the community. And so how do we hold this up as a cultural site? If you've ever been to Paris, if you've ever been to Rome, you go see the historic sites. These are some of the things that we want to highlight. There's some incredible assets that we have within the community that we want to be able to show. A part of the reason that this is such a crisis is that we lost an economy, right? We lost the steel mills. And when we lost the steel mills, that was thousands and thousands of jobs. Those jobs sent kids to college. Those jobs bought houses, bought cars, land appreciated. And so now we have to start thinking about what the next opportunities are for growth. And we started to track some of those. Some of those have to do with things related to technology. Some of those have to do with things related to a creative industry. But again, kind of thinking about what we have, we're thinking about an innovative economy. So we have the presidential center coming. We have the university when it comes to healthcare and quantum computing, things that we couldn't even imagine. You know, like, like much similar to when, 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 when I was a young person, I couldn't imagine saying, I wanna know what the score of the game is and typing it in and getting right now, we will find that quantum computing will have incredible impacts on what kind of jobs and what kinds of careers are available. Quantum computing and then the cultural production that takes place within our communities right now. So, you know, with all of these opportunities, what are the risks? So, so I believe you heard last week and one of the risks that people are worried about is, is displacement and gentrification, right? So we went back and, and did a look and, and, and thought that we know that there will be growth, right? And with growth, that really brings about change. Um, from my perspective, when I take a look at it and say, looking at this map, I think that the displacement has really happened already, right? Um, the Robert Taylor Homes were the largest housing projects in the United States. And every red dot that you see here is a city owned parcel of vacant land. It's 11.5 million square feet. In this same region, when you add the private uh, vacant land, it's over 300 acres of vacant land. That's larger than Disneyland. And so I believe that there's opportunity for growth and to create opportunities. So you, you are not talking about, the argument doesn't become about how do we not lose affordable housing. Right? We should be having the conversation about how we preserve affordable housing, but we should also talk about how to make sure that one can be lifted out of needing affordable housing. Every one of these red dots to me creates an opportunity, an opportunity for someone to learn a trade, an opportunity for someone to become a homeowner, a building owner, uh, a landscaper, a painter. There becomes a lot of opportunities, an opportunity to, to, uh, to start your own companies, and uh, entrepreneurship opportunities as well. Uh, we looked at this. This along the Dan Ryan corridor and the State Street corridor, which was not, a lot of this was not included in the stats that I just talked about. Here we're talking about 307 acres of vacant, of vacant and underutilized and city owned land. We believe there's an opportunity to talk about what the opportunities are to create new economy, 
these new steel mill type of opportunities where people will be able to, to in fact make a difference. So we, we like to think solutions oriented. So we're saying, well, what could happen if we started working together? So we see ourselves as four basic areas that we wanna work and we like having conversations like this because we think the solutions are going to be taking the best of what works from everything and, and working together. So first, to be a capital attractor, we have to attract dollars to these communities, resources to these communities. Not everything has to be checked, but sometimes it's intellectual capital. To be a truth teller, to use data, right? To use data. One of the things that, um, that I, I surprised myself recently in talking about uh, people are worried about losing the affordable housing in the area. I looked up the Section 8 vouchers. That's the, the it's a guaranteed federal payment uh, for low-income residents. In the, in the three communities of Washington Park, Woodlawn, and South Shore, there's $136 million of Section 8 vouchers coming into this area. Being a real estate professional, I don't see that as a negative. I see that as an opportunity to say, let's create some quality, affordable housing where people can be proud to live here while they are working to create other opportunities. That's how I see the opportunity. And I don't see anything in conflict with the communities living together. I live four blocks from, uh, from where I grew up, same neighborhood where I grew up. And uh, um, now this is an area that has changed a lot from, from when I grew up. And, and uh, I was called a gentrifier when I moved back into the neighborhood, right? It was kind of weird because it was the same neighborhood in which, in which I was raised. Um, and I don't think that there's anything wrong with, you know, living together and seeing examples of how one can grow up in the neighborhood and continue to live in the neighborhood. So using facts to be able to, uh, uh, to, to kind of drive where we want to go, to be a collaborator. One thing that I've uh, uh, come to, to learn in this position, and I've been the uh, executive, the president and CEO here for, for two years, is that our organizations, we know each other, but we don't really know each other. We haven't really taken the time. COVID has allowed us to kind of slow down, use the power of, of technology to get to know each other and to be able to see if we're working together and we all have the same goal of making an incredible neighborhood, what can we do if we're working together? And then to be an advocate. So we have we figured our work into three primary areas. And so what if we had $100 million and we focused in three areas, reparative investments, restorative investments, and resiliency investments. So when it comes to reparative, we thought about home ownership and land ownership. So uh, in my bio, uh, it was mentioned that uh, I have a, a company, Washington Park Development Group. And so I started buying land. I bought my first house when I was 17 years old. I used money from bagging groceries at a local grocery store. Um, and, and, and I bought a home when I went to college. And so I started investing early in real estate. Um, my, part, my business partner and I, we control a million square feet of vacant land. Vacant land is an asset. We have so much of it, people see it as a liability. Oh, it's so much vacant land. On a balance sheet, it's not. Right, and you just saw the maps to see how much we had. So how can we get people to say for a minimal amount of investment that you know is gonna be a guaranteed payoff, let's invest in this, let's hold this down. Let's keep, let's keep grandma's house, right? Let's figure out some strategies around that. But also that means to develop some black developers who are going to be the people to build on these vacant lots, right? And then thinking about how we can do it together. So you see something here called the Land Care Cooperative we recently applied for and were awarded a $2.5 million grant to take care of vacant lots in the neighborhood. This is something where we want community participation, it's job creation opportunities. This was done in um, Philadelphia. And what they found was that when they did this, there was an increase in property values. They, they did plantings, put up fencing, increase in property values, people's sense of mental health and well being increased. Um, and, you know, it, it, it was a sense of calm, a sense of peace in the community. So um, next, our cultural assets, right? How do we take care of the things that we have, right? We have museums, um, we have the, the, the parks themselves, Jackson Park and Washington Park, some of the community parks. There's a lot of community pride. And so let's make sure that we're taking advantage of this. 
And then the next thing were our resiliency investments. So as we started to think about access to, to, to Wi-Fi, we see during the COVID environments, our students don't have the ability to interact with their with the teachers and, and with your doctors. Our transit, we're blessed to be in a community that has significant transit and then our social connectivity. So I did a whole bunch of talk and I gave you a whole bunch of facts. Um, and so that's only kind of one start that's, I, I kind of want to give you a flavor, an overview of kind of the way that we view the community um, and the opportunities that we see. Thanks, Gian. This is a good opportunity to pause a bit then. And uh, you, thank you for your passion, your knowledge, your willingness to be with us today and share all this. Um, I'm going to pause for some responses and questions. Let, let me try one at you, Gion, while others may be um, formulating a response. You mentioned that one of your goals is to develop black developers. Yes. That's a, that's a concept that's easy to get your mind around, but how do you do it? How do you do it? Um, so, so I'm going to, I'm going to give an example. Now my words, I, I don't have the eloquent words like Reverend Knox here, but the way that, uh, so I'm gonna use myself as an example. So when I was a kid, I lived in a, a, a 12 unit building that my parents owned. And back in that day, allowance was a dollar a week when you were a little kid, right? Well, my allowance was $10 a week. Well, what did I have to do? I had to use old English with the rag, put the old English on it. I had to dust the handrails, dust the H spindle inside the building. I had to shovel the snow, even on a day like today. I had to rake the leaves. I had to fill the boiler with water, take out the tennis garbage. I then started to think about, okay, well, how can I get even more? So Sunday, the newspaper cost a dollar. Hey, I will run and go get the newspapers for you and get a tip if you need something from the store, since I had to do this stuff anyway, so let me add on, let me get an add on sale. And so I started to get different kinds of responsibilities. I started to learn how to do different things. Um, I bought a house at 17. I didn't know what I was doing. People asked me, well, where can I get started? Where you have to live someplace, get started. And so let's lay out, let's show what the program is. Let's make it like Lego blocks. It's not difficult. Right. If you have a Section 8 voucher, the reason I bring up the idea of the Section 8 vouchers, it's one hundred and thirty six million dollars. My wife is from uh, the Bronx, New York, and she lives in a place. She grew up in a place called Co-op City. If you guys remember what Robert Taylor Holmes looked like, this Co-op City, it looks just like Robert Taylor Holmes. So I'm young, 19 years old. I met this very pretty lady. I'm coming to visit her. It takes me an hour to get there, all the way in the Bronx before you get to Westchester. It's on the way to Connecticut. Oh, I'm so excited. I get off of the bus and I'm like, oh my God, she lives in the projects. And so I say to her, man, this is, and I get in, it's a white person in the elevator, a Spanish person, like a, a, a Asian person. And so I said to her, this is some really weird projects. There's white people in the projects, there's Asian people in the projects. This is some weird projects. It's hardwood floors in her apartment. I said, this is the weirdest projects I've ever been. And she said, this is not projects. This is a co-op. Everybody in here owns a little bit of not their apartment, but they own a bit of the corporation together. So it's no trash on the grounds, right? It, it, you know what I mean? Because this is your mom's home, right? And so from that perspective, I started to look and say, oh, when we all have something in in it, we're all in it together. So that $136 million worth of Section 8 vouchers, guess what? There are programs where you can use that to own something, right? So we have to think about that, but no one has taught us that, right? And there, the mechanism has to be there to say, man, I had a clogged up sink yesterday. I have an 18-year-old daughter and an and a, 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 a older wife. So I get clogged sinks all the time. I don't know how to fix that. I, you know. I, I'm gonna to have to call someone to go come and fix this. So someone, I have to be able to call and say, here's an opportunity for you to come fix the sink because my, I guarantee you twice a year, I'm gonna have a clog sink. I can guarantee you a job twice a year. And so can a, probably a whole bunch of people on the call. 
We have to think collectively about these issues and show people and make it like Lego blocks because the opportunity is there. Thanks, Ken. I was asking about how how do you how do you develop African American developers? Because obviously your company and you can't do all this by yourself. You need you need a lot of a lot of uh, players, right? That's right. And, and and so and that's the point is that some people will be interested in being a real estate developer. Some people are interested in. So the story I asked my grandmother. My grandmother died maybe about four years ago, and I asked her before she passed. What was different about Bronzeville then compared to now? Because of restricted covenants, because they could only live within a certain box, they had access to see the doctor, the lawyer, the scientist, the teacher, the police officer, the bank robber, the drug dealer. They saw everything, right? But now in these concentrations of significantly high poverty, you don't get exposure to that. This is my, 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 my wife and daughter think I'm crazy. I like flowers. I keep flowers around the house all the time. It was really cold last weekend. I went to the store. I bought a bouquet of flowers and I just took a spray bottle and I sprayed water on it just to see what would happen. Right. I was curious about it. And, you know, that's and, and so I wrote it down. Like if I did a science experiment, hey, my hypothesis was that it was going to freeze. It was going to look just like it. I could present it today for Valentine's Day. It will be artistic. Right. And so I tried something. Right. And so I need to be able to say, hey, uh, uh, um, hey, Betty C, you're a scientist. You worked at the, the laboratory over there. What how, what would be the process of me doing this? And you would say, well, you write your hypothesis and then you try this. And so part of it is, is, is exposure to different things. Right. And trying different things. And so I think that that's um, this is a part of what we have to do. Right. So, uh, yeah. Good. Th thanks, Gion. Uh, a couple of questions have come in the chat um, from Nancy Meislin. What consideration has been given to gardening and planting in the development of vacant land, um, which I think is sometimes called urban um, um, agriculture? Yes. So, so this is a double-edged sword, right? Um, so number one, let's start with this. This land is pretty polluted, right? It's contaminated. It's uh, um, there is so much contamination that you don't want to eat the carrots. That you, it's not you're going to have to import soil, and there's a cost to doing that. So that's the first part. The second part is, and, and I'm not saying that one is a pro con. Um, I'll use myself as an example. I bought my house in a vacant lot. And there was a, 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 an older lady who lived on the block for um, you know, 60 years or something. And the vacant lot is where she had her, um, she had her garden. Well, when I bought it, hey, you know, Miss Lee, I'm gonna end up building something on here. You know, she had been gardening there for 30 years. What do you mean you're gonna uh, build something on? This is my garden though. I said, yeah, I know, but I just bought it. She called the police on me for doing something on my vacant lot. Right. And so that's one of the things that we have to think about. Right. As growth comes, how do we coexist to make sure Miss Lee can still have her garden, but I can build my bill. Right. And so these are some of the things that I don't think it's I, I don't think the solutions are fit are set in stone, but that's one of the challenges. So one of the things that I did was um, I'm going to share screen again. So. I was in I was in Amsterdam. I, I, I like to travel a lot. I was in Amsterdam and I found, uh, this is a field of sunflowers. I planted, I took a, a one acre lot of city on vacant lot. And I was kind of like a, a, a pirate. And I, I was wanted to plant a field full of tulips. I saw it when I was in Amsterdam. I was like, ooh wee, this is gonna look nice. And I looked up the cost of tulips and I was like, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to do tulips. I'm going to do something much, much cheaper. And so I did a field full of sunflowers, an acre. And so somebody asked me, why did you do it? And I said, well, my theory is, is like this. The train is right next door to it, right? You can see the train. You can see the field of flowers from there. It was kind of like me on a train in Amsterdam. I said, imagine if I was going to work or coming home from work and I saw a field of beautiful yellow flowers. There's no way 
that I could say I had a bad day. I'm going to have a good day on my way to work. I'm going to have a good, even if it was a bad day, on my way home, my day is going to feel a little bit better because I see this field of flowers. Or if I was about to go shoot somebody and I pass by a field of flowers, maybe it's a chance that I'm going to change my mind because I never saw something so beautiful before. And it was just one of these experiments that I did, right? And it turns out sunflowers, it's all kind of beautiful things with sunflowers. They rotate with the sun. As the sun moves, they move. Right, that's a metaphor. I'm not exactly sure for what, but it's a metaphor, right? Uh, they remediate lead out of the ground. So at the same time, while you got something beautiful, it's, it's helping the soil, it's helping repair the soil. That's those reparative environments, right? I could say congregation during Transfiguration Sunday, would you guys like to buy a bouquet of flowers to support this entrepreneurship program and this, right? It, it was positive. You turned it into something positive, right? There's a quote that I say a lot. So, so I'm going to answer your question. There's a quote that I say, which is wealth is the byproduct of solving problems and creating value. If you do both of these things effectively, you create a high rate of return. I don't think wealth has anything to do with dollars. That's something that we put on that. Wealth is being healthy, is being happy, right? It's smiling. You know, guys like to take pictures like this. I, you would never ever find a picture with me not smiling because I, I you know what I mean? I want to be able to give you a little bit of energy and I want to be able to take a little bit of energy. So I do think that there are some opportunities with the vacant land. These are the ways that I try to solve these kind of problems. So, thanks, Keon. I think you may have also given Pastor Knox just the metaphor he needs for his sermon in a few minutes. <laughs> uh, a lot of good questions coming in in the chat, and people can put comments and questions there, or hopefully we'll be able to get to some raising of hands and so on. <clears throat> um, here's a question from Jen Guy. Uh, what are Gian's thoughts? Of, let me press it, uh, preface this, Gian. You know, last week we heard from Alex, yes. who has <clears throat> a great passion uh, around the issue of, of displacement, right? So uh, Jen's question is, what are Gian's thoughts about how to build trust within the community to overcome justifiable yes. fears about people being displaced? How do you build trust in the community when that is in the air. So, so I, I like, I, I'm reading a book right now called Atomic Habits. And basically it talks about how every day, if you just try to just get 1% better and the small little habits that we create, right? So I like to use different kinds of analogies. I remember going to a family reunion in Mississippi for the first time. And like, man, I don't wanna go meet these guys. They talk funny, they look different. You know, I don't want to do this, but you get to know each other and you guys are actually very similar, right? It's just your accent is different. Or if you ever been to Boston, you have, huh, what did you say? I had a cousin who lived in Boston. That's the same thing. We don't know each other, right? And, and we actually have more similarities than we have differences. And so that's a part of it. Um, again, I, 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 I've, I think working on the police board has helped me a lot because you probably can't get more divided than community police relationships. But when I talk to individuals, we all want the same things. We don't have the same way of expressing it. So that's a part of what we're trying to do. We think that doing things like having a potluck dinner and sitting down together is one of those things. That's what I wanna be that kind of bridge builder. I, I, Alex will tell you, I've never said that we were enemies, never not one day, because he has an objective and we need to ensure that his objective is met. And at the same time, we say we want opportunities, so we don't want to chase opportunities away. We have to understand what are the opportunities that come with growth? How can I uh, preserve uh, uh, grandma's house, right? Can I put it into a land trust so we can get creative together and try some of these things together? Thanks. Another question came in from Flory Lynn. Um, do you think that the Cabrini Green redevelopment worked? Why or why not? And I, I think the larger context here is, as uh, I'm sure you know, Guion, uh, over the last 20, 25 years, the CHA and the city have had this overarching goal to bring down the high rise public housing and replace it with low rise, mixed income, mixed use 
uh, developments and so on. Um, so do you, do you think that that approach has worked? Why or why not? Well, it, 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 it's, it's, I think it's a lot more complex than, than did it work. Um, obviously something had to be done with the projects, right? You, you just could not have that concentrated level of poverty like that um, and crime and all of that. So obviously something had to be done. Um, I think that the theory was, was, was probably right at the time. And I think that in time we will look back, it's easy for us to look back 25 years later and say, ah, you made the wrong decision, right? But at the time one had to make a decision. I think that from a real estate perspective, I mean, that was very valuable land and you know we see what it's turned into and there have been some people, low income opportunities, but no, the land was given away. I think that you're seeing it, um, the difference when you look at some of the other near West side by the United Center where, where there's a lot of growth, you're starting to see where Roosevelt Square, where that is becoming more and more market rate. But Chicago is so segregated that in areas like Washington Park, you know, market rate, who's the market rate buyer that's going to buy right there? And there's so many other options, right? So I think that it didn't really work for anybody. Uh, 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 I think it worked to get the land back uh, uh, and, and, and to create some value for some people, but it were not the people who endured uh, all of that pain for all of those years. And it wasn't like the money was replaced in the school system or anything like that. So, um, and I think that this is a part of why we're saying this land, how do you use this? When I think about reparations, the, the conversation about reparations, I think about give me the opportunity to rebuild on the projects, right? Create an opportunity like that. Um, so, so I, I, it's hard to, I don't, I can't really say it worked or it didn't work. There was things about it that worked. There were things about it that didn't. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Paul is asking a question. Do you, uh, do the public schools offer any courses on entrepreneurship? And a follow up there from Paul is what financial institutions are helping? Uh, Paul, do you, do you mean what financial institutions are helping create new entrepreneurs or well, there are, yeah let me um i think chase and maybe a couple of other banks have um set aside i forget a substantial amount of money to uh, in, uh open um uh, or to uh, provide loans um in uh, economically depressed areas of the city um and i just wondered if um you've been able to tap into any of that how that uh, coordinates with what you're trying to accomplish yeah, so um, so this is a it's a very complex web, and and this is kind of what I expect. So Chase kind of being an exception, they've already placed some dollars, some specific places. You know, COVID and Black Lives Matter was such a once in a lifetime type. Maybe maybe not maybe not Black Lives Matter not was a, not a once in a lifetime, but certainly COVID. Uh, it was such a flood of money. And it showed the such inequality, the imbalance that, that in my opinion, is created a dam. There's a lot of money sitting here trying to figure out how do we disperse all of this money. And during COVID, when people are shutting down and trying to still survive, there's, there's a backlog. And, and, and um, it's, uh, so I haven't, I, I asked the bank the other day, they pledged a hundred million dollars. So what are you spending it on? And they were like, we haven't quite figured it out yet. So that's one of the challenges. I think Chase has been one of the banks uh, that has actually placed some dollars. Um, so yes, we do want to try to tap into some of that. Are there programs that teach entrepreneurship? There are. Um, I think there certainly could be, could be more. I think that, um, I think that uh, I think that more people like me have to step in and start being, you know, more entrepreneurs have to step in and start being, you know, I won entrepreneurship contests and competitions and classes when I was in school. It was another class. It wasn't real. It was a class, right? Um, I think that we have to do some things to be able to say, I, I am an entrepreneur, right? I have a business license. I um, so. Uh, Yes, I made money. I, I, I explained to you guys, I bought my first house when I was 17 and I did save up some money uh, uh, from bagging groceries. But when I got to college, 
in my dorm room, I sold popcorn. Because the whole dorm, when you smell some popcorn, you got to buy it. You have no choice. I was going <laughs> sick. I went to college in Florida A&M in Tallahassee, Florida. I wanted caramel and cheese popcorn. I sold caramel and cheese popcorn in my dorm room. And that allowed me to buy a house, right? We don't have to invent the next Google to be able to create a good living for ourselves, right? And I know this wasn't specifically the question, but again, if we start to think about what, what we need, um, I'm an avid bike rider. I have a bike set up right here in my office and I ride typically about 5,000 miles a year on my bike. So I stopped driving. I said, you know what? What if I couldn't afford a car? I stopped driving and I go everywhere by bike. It's bad on a day to like today, but you can still do it on a day like today. But guess what? I lost 30 pounds. I didn't have tickets anymore, speeding tickets, red light camera tickets, insurance, car payment, maintenance. I didn't have that anymore. So really, I didn't even need to make so much money. I could have made less money, right? And so a part of this is we have to kind of think about the resources we have. And if I could make... I talked to one of the kids the other day who was a carjacker. And so I asked him, man, you know, what, what, what is happening, man? What, how much are you selling these cars for? How much are you making? Man, the man said they only need to make about $75 a day. So shame on us if we can't teach somebody how to go make $75 a day instead of carjacking somebody. Shame on us, right? So I just think that, yes, they do have those programs. I think that we have to amplify it. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Jen, you sent me a question. I'm going to hold it because I think it might be a good way to end our session today. Um, Marcy had a good question here. Um, bring us back to the Obama Presidential Center. What and how are you and your organizations working to use the Obama Center as a development for local yes, residents? Yes, yes. So again, starting with the basics, starting with the vacant land, they're going to spend X amount of million dollars fixing up the vacant lots, right? So I want to use this four or five years that we have before it opens to train a cadre of people from these communities to get ready to get those jobs, fixing, fixing up the Obama Center. If we know that they're going to plant this species and that species and that species, let's start growing it right now. We got the perfect laboratory, all these vacant lots. We have the same kind of plants that they have in Jackson Park and we can transplant them. I'm making that as an example. I'm not really a gardener. I don't know if you can really transplant it from one place to another, but these are the kinds of creative opportunities that we have to think about. I don't, I'm, I'm not positive that in five years, I will get, not I, but our community will get 63rd Street looking like the destination that we want it to be or 71st Street or Garfield. And so I'm not sure that I can import your physical person to come visit some of these places in five years, but the coffee you drink might be brewed on 63rd Street. The hot dog you eat might be manufactured in Bronzeville. The t-shirt you buy may be printed in South Shore. I may be able to imp to, to, to get some of these services and import your dollars back into the community, which creates more opportunities. I may be able to have a hotel that you wanna stay in. We got a training program. So we're starting to think about how can we use this, the, 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 the opportunity of a couple of billion dollars coming to our neighborhood to springboard, to create some other opportunities, right? This by itself will not solve, our, the Obama Center will by itself will not solve the problems of the South Side but it can create a springboard for us to be able to say, oh, I got a great idea, right? And, 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 and they gave me, a, a, it's like the vaccines, right? Some company is trying a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And another company is trying, this is the same thing we want to do. We want to partner with Winneka. We want to come up there and, 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 and have some opportunities, right? So this is how we're thinking about it. Thanks. And a question from Gene. Uh, can you say more about how you'll be executing the empty lot grant? Ah, <clears throat> and has it already started? Yeah. So, so again, I'm kind of an experimenter. So it has started, but I started in a pirate kind of way, right? I took a city lot. I just put a fence up figuring they wouldn't say anything. I cut the grass. They wouldn't say anything. And so we just got the grant. So that was just like an experiment. So we just got the grant. We've partnered with an organization called Green Corps. 
Green Corps actually, so I gave you the example of Philadelphia where they got a 26% reduction in violent crimes and increase in property value and all of that. Well, we also wanna incorporate art into it. So we wanna see if we can get an outdoor exhibition from the Art Institute or the museum or the Obama Center to do that. And so what we're doing now is we're working with other organizations. We just got the grant docs a couple of days ago. So we're working now with other organizations to say, okay, exactly what is it that we're gonna do? We put together a five year, $25 million plan to fix every single one of those vacant lots that we showed you, right? So the first year we're targeting $5 million. So we have 2.6, about 2.7 million that we've raised so far. Our first year, we wanna raise 5 million. We want to work with local churches, local landscaping, local, local landscaping companies, women-owned landscaping companies, minority-owned landscaping companies, a part of the program is not just cutting the grass and putting up fencing and, and planting plants and bushes and trees and flowers. A part of it is sending people to entrepreneurship workshops to teach them how to start a company. We have Sunshine, uh, Sunshine Ministries, which has an incredible program. The YWCA has an incredible program, a program called Bill Bronzeville and uh, 71st Street Chamber of Commerce. Each of these has funding from the city and state to help local entrepreneurs. We wanna track it. We wanna be able to say, we had a hundred people go through the program, 50 people actually started a company, 25 people got minority or women or veterans certified. We wanna track their growth over time. We wanna introduce them to new clients, introduce them to banking opportunities. We wanna be there to help them. Not that we're gonna do it. I'm gonna say, hey, Junior, you know somebody at um, at a Wintrust Bank? Can you make the introduction? Or, or you know, hey, uh, uh, Eleanor, we need your help. You know this group over here. This guy, he's a great carpenter. This is how we want to do this. Has anybody ever seen a commercial for Danley's Garages? You guys live in Chicago, right? Sure. Danley's Garages. You see the commercial. We'll build a garage in two days. We should be training people to build a garage in two days, right? Danley's has been uh, uh, seven seven three. Uh, uh, and I, now I forgot the phone number. Empire. We could create our own empire, right? That's memorable in all of our heads right now. We could be creating the same kind of opportunities. Yeah, thanks. Um, I remember when I was in high school, there was a junior achievement organization, and I just did a quick Google search. There's still junior achievement in Chicago as a way of training uh, young people to think of themselves as entrepreneurs, not only in theory, but in practice. Absolutely. I think JA is an incredible program. I don't volunteer there regularly, but typically once or twice a year, I go and speak to some of their classes. And, you know, I think uh, the same, if you think about when we were young people, man, we all had some dreams of what it is that we wanted to be, right? And sometimes it was just, it was a fantasy in our head. I applied is fun fact. I applied to University of Hawaii for college because I was dreaming in my head that college was going to be on the beach. I had never been to Hawaii. I'd never been anywhere really, right? And so, man, how do we foster some of these dreams and, 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 and give people an opportunity to try some of the things that they want to do? So JA is in CPS? Uh, um, I don't know the answer to that one. I can't remember if they're in CPS. Just wondering. Yeah, yeah. They are in CPS. They are in CPS. Yeah. Okay. They are. Um, continuing a question from Greg, is Emerald South working with Chicago Community Trust? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Chicago Community Trust is absolutely, they were one of the initial funders that, 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 that helped up to prop up position. Uh, we've received several rounds of funding from them for different programs, including some general operating support. Um, and again, that's a part of collaboration to me, right? Because they are an organization that oversees the whole city. The money is certainly important, but I think them introducing us to other organizations where we can see that symbiotic work. If you ever watched National Geographic and you saw the cow and it's a bird sitting on the back and the bird eats the flies, this is how we have to start to work with each other. So the trust, yes, we need the money, but we also need that brain power from them too. A comment from uh, Jennifer, I watched black men in white coats yesterday about the need to encourage black men to enter, <clears throat> sorry, enter the medical profession. An ongoing theme was you can't be it if you can't see it. 
And her comment is, I hope more people see Gion. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I, I really appreciate that. And you know, the, the funny part is, is that it's a lot more Gion's out here. So I, I often, people ask me, man, hold on, man, you work for Emerald South, you own a company, you're the president <clears> of the police board. You know, how do you do it? I have a daughter, 18 year old daughter. People say, I see you with your daughter, you all, you went to, I went to the Nutcracker one time, 18 years, my daughter, I mean, 18 times in one season, because my daughter was the main character. How do you do it all? And the point is, is that you do it all. Somebody has to do it, right? And so I don't, I wish I didn't have to do it all, but until somebody else steps up to help me, I'm going to keep doing it, right? So I asked a group of friends one time, I said, hey, have you guys ever mentored a kid? Like, nah, I don't really know how to mentor a kid. I said, well, let me tell you what I do. First, I just go speak in the schools. I ask teachers, I ask uh, reverends, I ask um, uh, entrepreneurs, give me one of your kids. Or they'll say, hey, man, I got one of your kids. And what I do, I don't change my schedule at all, right? If I got lunch, hey, by the way, Mike is coming with me to lunch. Is that okay? Yeah. And then I'm going to introduce him to you. And then, you know, it's, 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 it's exposure. I, uh, my daughter... My daughter is an art history major. Now, I'm a business guy. I'm like, how do you major in art? How will you ever make a living in art, right? But I was like, what if I had the opportunity? Now, it just so happens business is what I wanted to do. But what if I had the opportunity to just do what I really wanted to do, right? What if you had the opportunity? If you said, man, I want to be an artist and just just draw comic books, if that's what you really wanted to do, if that's what made you happy, right? I think that this is the kind of opportunities we should be offering young people. I think that if we can work on them having a good childhood, right, and creating opportunities for them, the basics, food, clothing, shelter, if we could take that off of the table and just make sure people had that, now the sky is the limit. But if I'm focused about being cold, I don't have, I got to sleep in two jogging suits and a coat. Yeah, you know what I mean? How can, how can I get you to focus on being an entrepreneur? It's a whole different conversation. So, Gian, um, we're in our last uh, five minutes here. Um, there were a number of questions I've been holding here for the end, and I think they all have to do with um, what can we do, basically. Um, Jen's comment begins, hope is a force multiplier. How do we in Winnetka contribute to hope? And I don't know that if Jen's question was for Gion or just something for us to think about, um, but Gion, what kind of partnerships outside of the South Side and out, even outside the city of Chicago um, are you envisioning as, as part of this uh, broader effort? Yeah. Um, I, I like hope. I like hope. I do like hope. But hope is very passive to me. I, I, I studied martial arts my whole life and martial arts is not offense. It really is defense, right? It's, it's, it's passive. It's passive, but it's force. So I wanna end this, 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 this battle as quickly as I can end this battle. And I'm gonna be precise with the scalpel, right? Uh, a protracted warfare is, is never a good thing. We have these incredible challenges right now and each of us have something that is very special about us that we bring to the table. I think when we think action oriented about what we individually, collectively can contribute to this potluck dinner. I, I, if you guys ever invite me to a potluck, if it's something bought from a store, I'm probably not going to eat it. But if you made it in your kitchen, that's what I want to eat. Because I want to taste your the way your grandmother put seasonings together and taught you how to put seasonings together. And I'm going to teach you mine. And I'm pretty sure they're going to taste similar, right? How, I, how did I go to the University of Chicago Business School? I, was a, I was a, worked at a health club checking somebody in. And a guy, I said, man, what's University of Chicago GSB? I see you guys wearing these t-shirts. That's the business school. That same guy, when I was in high school, wrote a recommendation letter for me to go to business school. And two years ago, I won the Distinguished Award, the, uh, the, the top award that the school gives out worldwide from a guy 
who helped me, all I did was swipe him into the health club, right? He took the time to invest in me, right? And so whatever we have to invest in these communities, we have access to the whole world right now. How do we do that to make our communities better? It's, 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 you don't want to get carjacked wherever you live, and I don't want to get carjacked where I live. Let's create some opportunity. I keep it simple. Let's do it if for no other reason so we don't get carjacked, right? We can keep it simple. And so whatever you have to bring to the table, I want it. It's an asset. And, 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 and I'm, I'm creating an incredible balance sheet, Constance, Madge, Gregory, Eleanor, Vince, Nancy, Linda. That's my balance sheet for Emerald South. You guys, right? What do we bring to the table? And, 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 and I believe that we can accomplish a whole lot. Well, Guyan, I really appreciate your uh, energy, your insights, your knowledge, Thank and you. your obvious love for the place you grew up in where you have chosen to live and do your good work. I want to read just one comment that also came in, so you're sure to hear it, uh, from Nancy in our circle this morning. She says, bless you for the creative and foundational work you do. Thank you. So I think Nancy speaks on behalf of all of us. Uh, perhaps we can continue to be in touch in some way. Absolutely. I, I do want to um, say uh, next Sunday is the first Sunday in Lent already. And uh, J.S. Hedigard and I will be leading you next week in an opportunity to learn how to slow down spiritually, uh, to enjoy God's presence in, uh, in a contemplative way. And we'll be providing you with at least two very specific Lenten practices uh, for prayer and reflection. Um, also want to thank uh, Pastor Jesse Knox for being with us the last two weeks. Um, Jesse, we have a minute. Do you have um, do you have anything you would like to respond to with uh, Guyon's presentation? And by the way, Jesse is on the board of Emerald South. Jesse, do you have any uh, responses? No, no. It's, it was uh, thank you, Guyon. Hey, well, it's been nice to have you with us, Jesse. Always nice to see you.